All right, welcome to Unit 4, Collection of Evidence and Crime Scene Investigation. In this unit, we'll be discussing the different types of evidence, the uh, proper collection procedures, the proper search procedures, all the things that will uh, help hopefully lead to a thorough and productive search and the correct uh, collection for later analysis of physical evidence. When discussing evidence, of course, we should keep in mind Locard's exchange principle, every contact leaves a trace. So uh, from that principle, we expect to find uh, evidence that links the suspect, victim, and scene. The type of evidence we're probably most likely to find because ordinarily a suspect who knows what he or she's doing will uh, take a large piece of evidence and uh, make sure to uh, remove them from the scene or obscure them. Uh, so it's really trace evidence, minute pieces left at a crime scene by a perpetrator or victim that we'll mainly be focusing on because those are the types of evidence that are likely to still be present. Uh, in order to be useful, of course, the uh, trace evidence or any evidence for that matter must be collected property, properly and legally. Um, so uh, in the case of legally, if it's uh, an illegally obtained piece of evidence, then it can be thrown out of court. If it's not properly collected, something like a biological fluid, uh, if it's improperly collected, it could be rendered unusable because of the growth of molds, for instance, if it's not packaged correctly. And we'll talk about that later on. So uh, obviously, uh, proper and legal collection of evidence is of the utmost importance here. Now, as a reminder, there are two main classifications for evidence. There's direct evidence, also called testimonial evidence, and this would be statements made under oath. Uh, of course, in uh, this sort of uh, evidence type, the reliability of the witness is key. So uh, even eyewitnesses, uh, if their statement has been taken uh, after some time or just their own um, observations being um, skewed by their own uh, personal uh, feelings, uh, whether they're conscious or subconscious feelings, uh, unfortunately, eyewitnesses can be influenced by lots of different factors, whether they know it or not, and uh, this can render them less than reliable in certain cases. That's how you'll see um, certain times you'll have an eyewitness uh, from the prosecution and an eyewitness called um, from the defense or cross-examined, and uh, the stories can change dramatically uh, just because of those different uh, layers of uh, perception from uh, the different witnesses or even just time that's elapsed between the actual crime and the time that they're called to testify. Uh, things can be a little blurry for uh, people, especially after any number of uh, days, years, months, whatever's passed. The other type of evidence, the type we tend to deal in more in forensics, is the indirect or circumstantial evidence, and this relies on an inference to connect it to a conclusion of fact. So this is our physical evidence, uh, just a few listed here. We'll talk a little bit about um, some of the body fluids uh, and other things in this chapter. We'll have you know our own chapters coming up for things like hair and fingerprints, and so uh, we'll be discussing physical evidence for the rest of the semester, really, but uh, we'll have a brief introduction to some key pieces of physical evidence here in Unit 4. All right, so the first one we're going to discuss is body fluids. That's the first type of physical evidence we'll mention here because that's uh, a type of biological uh, evidence. And um, DNA technology is fairly recent, uh, really, in terms of how long it's been applied, mid-1980s. Uh, before it was applied in the forensic setting and, uh, you know, several years after that before it really became commonplace. Uh, but nowadays it's just expected in case of violent crime that there'll be DNA analysis, juries expect to hear about it. Uh, so uh, anything that has the potential for DNA analysis is very valuable evidence. So blood, saliva, sweat, semen, these are all uh, potential sources of DNA. We show a picture of urine on the screen. Urine is actually a fairly sterile uh, body fluid. It's not uh, typically too useful, uh, and it, that's why it's not one that we've listed. Uh, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be considered, but uh, it's not typically um, as uh, good a source of DNA as the ones we listed here. 
And based on DNA technology, uh, being able to replicate DNA uh, through things like polymerase chain reaction, even a single drop of blood could be very valuable evidence if you can magnify the DNA present to get uh, amounts that are usable uh, for uh, identification purposes. So any of these body fluids, we'll talk about the proper packaging later, but of course they're body fluids. They should be uh, air dried if they're on a carrier like a piece of clothing, uh, it's packaged in paper uh, rather than plastic. Sealed plastic will let the moisture build up and molds can form. So uh, we'll um, talk later about how important it is to uh, collectly collect correctly, sorry, correctly package uh, physical evidence, especially biological evidence for that reason. But uh, just a few examples of some body fluids that could be potential sources of DNA. Another type of physical evidence that's uh, potentially important at a scene is hair evidence. Now, hair has a fairly uh, controversial history. Uh, there were cases like the Central Park Five, uh, where those five young men were uh, wrongly convicted based largely on hair evidence, uh, as well as their own uh, false confessions. Uh, so um, when you're dealing with hair evidence, you have to be careful. Um, there are certain things that we can tell. Uh, first of all, we can tell if it's animal or human hair or wig fiber or something like that. Um, and just because it's animal hair doesn't necessarily mean it's not uh, useful to the case. Uh, we'll uh, mention the Wayne Williams case later in the semester, and there was a case where some dog hair uh, proved to be some pretty important physical evidence. Uh, but um, if it is human hair, uh, we do have the possibility for DNA analysis uh, and individualization, but that's not what was done back in the Central Park 5 case, uh, and it was fairly misleading uh, that the experts testified that the hair was as individualized as it was when really it wasn't. It was, you know, um, African American uh, hair, hair of, of African descent, coarse hair, but that wasn't um, where they stopped their testimony. The hair experts went on to say that it was consistent with those men, and I guess consistent with them is. Uh, fair, but uh, it really implied to the jury that it belonged to uh, those men, uh, and that was not the case. So you have to be careful with hair. It's good evidence. If you can find the follicular tag on the hair, then you can get individualized DNA evidence, uh, but otherwise it tends to be class characteristic evidence. Um, still worthwhile, still worth collecting, whether it's human or animal hair. Um, look at clothing. Um, surfaces, carpets, places where uh, you're likely to find the hair. If the hair is forcibly removed, it might be uh, under nails of victims, uh, and that's the type of hair that might really have the follicular tag intact. If it was ripped from the suspect, uh, then it's uh, more likely to have that follicular tag. So hopefully our uh, victim did get in some defensive wounds and maybe got to grab some hair and uh, left uh, some uh, follicular tags intact for analysis. Okay, so we've mentioned DNA already, and as I've said, DNA is a type of evidence that uh, juries are expecting to hear about in violent crimes. So we have our picture there to see that the suspect three has the DNA match to the crime scene. Uh, and again, this is a bit misleading also. It makes us think that our DNA is very different. Our DNA uh, for humans uh, is all very, very similar. So uh, we share, you know, over 99% of our uh, genome uh, for any human, but the small differences, the, the bands that we're looking for in this region where we have the differences, uh, those are amplified for the purposes of identification. So it's a really small set of differences, but uh, scientists have figured out how to make that uh, individualized type evidence because we can make those small differences magnified. Uh, we already talked about blood, semen, saliva, uh, body, body tissues rather, and the body fluids that I just mentioned. Um, as well as hair, if it has the follicular tag, um, cells, skin cells, or other cells. Uh, sometimes they're older, like the top layer of skin cells might not have usable DNA, but uh, lower down, uh, you're more likely to find usable DNA. So as I mentioned, the fingernails of the victim would be a good place to look for cells that may still have uh, nuclear DNA for analysis. But uh, DNA is a, a great type of evidence. Uh, 
identical twins is about the only time when it's not your best friend uh, but uh, in that case hopefully you've got some fingerprinting or other types of evidence that we'll talk about uh, in addition to the dna just to keep the juries happy they don't like to convict identical twins because they're not sure which twin since the dna is identical there okay moving on to a very different type of physical evidence explosive evidence um, so this would be evidence from a bomb or other device that's uh, either detonated or was intended to detonate and just never went off. Um, there's, uh, in the case of accelerants, if we're talking about an arson investigation, uh, the accelerants would be those flammable substances that would be uh, intended to start the fire in the first place. Uh, and um, oxidizers and reducers are important in either arson or uh, explosive investigations. Uh, in the case of uh, a fire, arson, uh, the oxidizer would be the oxygen in the air, and the reducer would be the fuel and that accelerant that was used to initially start the fire. Um, fires can burn very quickly, but compared to explosions, the fires are slow because the oxygen, the oxidizer in the air, has to get to the uh, fuel, the reducer. Uh, but uh, in the case of a, a, a bomb or a, an explosive device, you've got the oxidizers and reducers mixed together uh, and they just need that um, shock or spark or whatever is going to uh, cause the detonation there of the explosive. So in either case, whether we're talking about an explosive or an arson investigation, um, you tend to see the um, serial arsonists or the serial bombers uh, do the same sorts of things. They get their routine and they get used to it and that's one way that you can link a particular uh, arson investigation or explosion investigation to a particular uh, suspect because they would use the same sort of detonator for instance in the case of an explosive or the same accelerant and the same uh, pattern of that accelerant in the case of an arsonist. They also tend to be very proud of their work so you might uh, comment on how well done the arson was and the, the suspect who's been denying it all along might suddenly say oh well you know I I do take pride in this work and that sort of thing. So if you want to get into the psychological angle, um, in the case of serial arsonists, serial bombers, sometimes uh, flattery will get you everywhere with those suspects. Okay, looking at fabrics, another type of physical evidence, uh, we have to consider the type of fabric. Uh, so natural uh, fabrics, fibers like cotton or wool are from natural sources. So plant or animal sources, cotton obviously from a plant and this country has a, a deep history with cotton and uh, its ties to slavery and things like that. Um, wool, uh, obviously from the sheep and animal source. Uh, so these would be examples of our natural fibers, nature makes them and then uh, humans uh, manipulate the fibers into uh, fabrics, clothing, or, or other such fabrics. Regenerated fibers, these would be um, recycled is one way to think about it. They're um, fibers from a natural source like cotton that have been chemically modified. So they have a side chain that's been uh, modified. Um, so you get something like a rayon where it's made from cotton. So it's relatively cheap because cotton's a pretty um, available crop. Um, so it's uh, a relatively cheap source, chemically modified to be uh, more like a silky material. Silk obviously is a natural fiber, very expensive from those silkworm cocoons, uh, but rayon has that silkiness uh, at the cotton price tag. So that's an example of a regenerated fiber. And then of course we've got our synthetic fibers, uh, nylon, polyester are some examples. And so these are very different. Uh, they were completely uh, created in the lab by chemists. Uh, and so nylon, for instance, is a, a very stretchy fabric. If you look at our picture there, we have the nylon stockings that uh, originally were just called nylons. Um, another application for nylon would be parachute cords. You need, uh, in that situation, something that can stretch without snapping, right? Your life depends on that. So uh, nylon has that stretch and give that you're not going to find in uh, many natural fabrics. So uh, synthetic fabrics uh, have their place uh, either for cost or for uh, their properties like nylon. Okay, we've mentioned before that illegal drugs is the largest volume of physical evidence. Uh, so uh, we have our uh, three satellite crime labs plus the uh, Albany crime lab uh, 
uh, that deal mainly in analyzing illegal drugs. Uh, so um, unfortunately, we're not doing terribly well in that war on drugs. Um, and uh, we could certainly spend the whole semester just talking about illegal drugs and uh, the impacts and the, the um, classifications. But uh, since we don't have that kind of time, we'll just give a quick overview here and we'll talk a little more later in the course. But uh, narcotics, narcotics is a term that's used in law enforcement to uh, really talk about a unit that's devoted to uh, illegal drugs. But narcotics are technically one subgroup of the illegal drug classification. So narcotics specifically, uh, dull pain, they bring sleep, narcos if you know your Greek. So uh, morphine, codeine, um, uh, in terms of current issues, we've got heroin is a big uh, problem in terms of the uh, modified um, uh, narcotics or uh, fentanyl is a synthetic narcotic. So uh, very, very, um, serious issues with those in terms of abuse, um, not so much for codeine, but for morphine and fentanyl and um, heroin. Stimulants, on the other hand, where the narcotics bring sleep, uh, stimulants um, speed up the body. They elevate mood. Uh, methamphetamines are a biggest example, or at least the one that's the biggest problem currently. Um, and uh, methamphetamine uh, isn't produced in very large quantities domestically, but uh, nearby, the Mexican cartels, for instance, uh, are producing it uh, by the ton. Uh, so uh, methamphetamine is still a problem. Uh, the uh, epidemic here with the opioids has sort of distracted from methamphetamine, uh, but it's still there. It's, it's been um, more under the radar uh, with the opioid epidemic claiming most of the media coverage, but methamphetamine is still a huge problem. Uh, and uh, especially uh, methamphetamine being imported from uh, other places like Mexico, for instance. Uh, hallucinogens, they cause hallucinations. LSDs are a classic example. Uh, the chemist who made it uh, accidentally uh, synthesized LSD uh, was the first one to take an LSD trip, and he uh, categorized those trips in his autobiography. Um, a lot of entertainers, and creative people, artists, musicians uh, have experimented with LSD. Uh, the Beatles, John Lennon in particular, was an LSD user. His wife did not like LSD, his first wife, and that uh, was one of the main reasons for the breakup of their marriage was uh, he enjoyed the trips. He had positive trips on LSD. She did not. She had very negative trips, and it was just such a part of his lifestyle that uh, I don't mean to say it was the only thing, but it was one of the things that contributed to that, uh, the breakdown of that marriage. If we look at depressants, uh, they depress arousal. Uh, they are sort of anti-stimulants, right? They uh, slow things down. Alcohol uh, is a strange substance in that, uh, you know, maybe one small drink can have almost a stimulant effect, but then continued drinking of alcohol will uh, have the depression effects kick in and be more prevalent. Uh, cannabis, marijuana is a depressant uh, and Again, depending on what state you're in, uh, may or may not be legal for recreational use, um, but at least at this time, it's uh, still federally uh, regulated and illegal. Steroids, uh, their uh, testosterone mimics, they're typically abused by athletes. And again, any uh, athletic contest, you run the risk of that. It's, uh, you know, baseball, golf, football, uh, you name it. And unfortunately, there are people who have uh, abused steroids to try to increase their uh, edge uh, athletically. And then finally, we'll have our club drugs. Uh, so uh, GHB is more uh, like the hallucinogens. It, it just uh, is used in the club scene, uh, whereas rohypnol is a drug that's uh, termed the date rape drug. Uh, that's one that's slipped to people unknowingly, uh, and it makes them much more likely to engage in things like sexual activity that they would not otherwise consent to uh, and that they really have no memory of afterwards. So that's what makes it so dangerous. And that's why you should never accept a drink from anyone uh, or leave your drink and return to it if you're uh, at a party. Uh, always go and get a new drink uh, from the, someone you can trust, the bartender, uh, so that you know that it hasn't been dosed with rohypnol or any such substance. All right, so uh, we'll have to leave drugs for now, but uh, certainly an area we're going to touch on again throughout the course and uh, unfortunately an, an area that uh, the country has a lot of 
um, work to do to uh, combat the problem of illegal drugs. Okay, moving into another area that unfortunately uh, has given us a lot of problems, uh, especially in recent times, uh, firearms. So uh, firearms are useful in law enforcement for the law enforcement end, right, to uh, act as a deterrent and to help uh, protect life and things uh, of that nature. Uh, but we also uh, in the U.S. have a lot of firearms related incidents where it's a uh, suspect that is uh, misusing those firearms, using them to cause fear and harm. And uh, that's, you know, just a, a very sad and unfortunate situation that we're in uh, currently where we see uh, almost on a daily basis a um, report of uh, firearms being misused. So. Um, we'll talk uh, about firearms because of their relation to crime and their use in uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, so um, we'll talk about ammunition and uh, gunshot residue tests in particular. Um, so a gunshot residue test is a way to determine if a suspect has fired a weapon within the past 24 to 48 hours or so, uh, and it involves swabbing the uh, trigger hand and uh, looking for uh, the um, chemical evidence of a gunshot residue. Of course, nothing illegal if the person had uh, legally, you know, used their weapon at a firing range or something like that. Uh, but oftentimes suspects might not realize that and they might lie about not having fired a weapon when it's pretty easy to prove that they have. So if they're smart, they'll just, uh, you know, see that they're at a firing range and make sure people uh, eyewitnesses are there to see them there as well to corroborate their story. Um, but uh, the other way we can test for gunshot residue is on the victim. If it's a close range shot, then the victim will also have gunshot residue. And that's an indication that it's a very close range or even a point blank type uh, um, execution style shooting. So uh, not only the suspect, but also the victim can be checked for gunshot residue. So um, we'll talk more about firearms later, but uh, just touching on some key ideas there today. Uh, glass, another type of physical evidence that probably doesn't sound so exciting, uh, but again, in uh, particular, we can look at glass with respect to uh, DNA evidence. If a person has smashed through glass to gain entry to a building or residence, um, sometimes they may cut themselves uh, if they're not uh, experienced uh, in doing such uh, activity. And so that could be a potential source of DNA. Uh, you could also potentially find the glass fragments on the suspects in their clothes or shoes or uh, something like that. So that could be very damning evidence. Uh, also to piggyback what we just mentioned about firearms, right? Firearms uh, are unfortunately often used in the commission of a crime. And so uh, we can see that the um, order of uh, shots fired, for instance, you could uh, distinguish between these two uh, bullet patterns here and see which one was fired first and uh, if they were fired from inside or outside uh, with respect to uh, multi-plane glass. So uh, those are things we'll talk about when we get a little deeper into our discussion of glass. Uh, soil evidence. Uh, soil is actually analyzed in a lot of the same ways that glass is analyzed. Uh, you can use density uh, determinations and things like that. So uh, soil and glass actually go hand in hand, even though you might not have expected that. Um, when we talk about soil, we'll talk about uh, trying to keep the lumps together. Whole lumps are what we desire. Don't uh, break up the lumps if you can avoid it. Uh, the key places to look for uh, soil uh, on the underbody and tires of vehicles, uh, if they've gone off road in particular uh, to uh, either dispose of a body or commit some other sort of crime, uh, then uh, that's a, a likely place to find the soil evidence that might link them to that uh, burial site, for instance, um, clothing. Uh, if, I don't know what the styles are. Uh, I'm not the most fashionable person, but uh, especially if um, cuffs are in, right? If, um, you know, uh, pants with cuffs at the bottom, uh, those are great places to catch uh, soil evidence, a glass for that matter as well. Um, and uh, also if you're investigating uh, a case where soil evidence is important, um, you would want to definitely collect from the crime scene. And if the suspect has an alibi, collect from the alibi location and make sure that the alibi is uh, really solid. If the person says they were at uh, such and such a place and they don't have any soil 
uh, on their shoes or clothing to uh, match that alibi location, but they do have crime scene location uh, soil, then uh, that can be some pretty damning evidence. So certainly worth checking not only the crime scene, which I think most investigators would know that, but uh, also checking the alibi location to corroborate a, uh, a suspect story. Okay, earlier we talked about fingerprints as the identification system that replaced Bertillion's failed method. So fingerprints are still as useful today as they ever were, uh, and DNA uh, hasn't replaced the traditional fingerprint uh, because the traditional fingerprint is the way to distinguish identical twins where DNA is very, very similar. It's the same at birth, but there may be some minor changes that could make it distinguishable later in life. But uh, that uh, hasn't been uh, tried very well uh, in the courts. The juries still like to see traditional fingerprints if they want to distinguish between identical twins because the DNA fingerprint is just too close. Uh, the different types of prints, so latent prints are the ones we're most likely to find because they're the ones that the suspect probably doesn't know he or she has left behind. Uh, they need to be powdered and lifted or chemically um, developed in order to be observed, um, as opposed to the visible or the patent prints. They can be seen without any aids. They're not typically left behind by your career criminals, but maybe in some sort of crime of passion or something like that, a, a person might panic and leave behind visible prints. Uh, finally, plastic prints are um, prints left in a soft material, so melted candle wax, putty from window panes, thick grease deposits on car parts. Uh, we see our plaster of Paris example there, so maybe you even made for mom or dad a, a small um, example of your fingerprint or your whole handprint if you were um, so inclined. So uh, that would be an example of a, a plastic print, something where you pressed into a material that deformed easily and left behind a print. So those are the types of prints and we'll talk more about them as we get into uh, our later unit uh, with fingerprinting as its focus. And here we see a close-up of uh, the friction ridges, the fingerprint uh, of this individual. And we'll talk more about the different patterns. See, this is a nice uh, symmetrical pattern. We'll talk about what that means when we get into the fingerprinting chapter, but uh, just a nice um, close-up view. And hopefully uh, you take a look at your own prints and see how wonderful and uh, amazing they are. Um, they have usefulness, right? Friction ridges help us to grip things uh, but they also can uh, identify us by that random pattern that forms. All right, now we get into what our textbook calls transient physical evidence. So this would be, for example, impressions or pattern evidence. So uh, these are produced by direct contact between a person and an object or between two objects. Uh, so shoes, tires, teeth, tools. Um, the reason they're transient is because if you think about a uh, footprint uh, in sand or a tire track in the mud, um, as uh, the um, time goes by, that uh, particular type of physical evidence may be lost. And that's why we make uh, impressions so that we can have something long lasting, right? As the mud dries, the uh, tire track might crack and break and uh, animals might walk over it or other cars might run over the same area. and. Uh, you might lose that uh, type of physical evidence. So that's why it's important in those cases that you take the um, impression so that you have something that is uh, more permanent in nature and can be used to uh, identify the uh, vehicle or the shoe or whatever happened to make those particular patterns. So that's why we um, have uh, in the case of um, uh, plaster of Paris or some sort of material that might be able to be used is often just kept around in uh, a squad car, for instance, in case uh, you end up with some transient evidence. You don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, you need to be able to preserve it. So you've got that ready made, uh, ready to make, I should say, um, impression material so that it's pre-measured and you can mix it up and uh, use it right on the spot so that you don't lose this evidence that uh, isn't always around for the long term. Here we see an example of uh, taking an impression from a door. So um, we don't have the same time pressure, right? The door is probably not going to uh, be so uh, transient in nature, but it's a big piece of physical evidence. You're not going to want to seize that whole door slab and have to store that in the crime lab. 
Uh, so it's much more convenient to take an impression of the small area of damage and then uh, be able to use that to match, say, the tool mark that might have uh, been used to force entry through that door. So uh, we see here the um, soft uh, rubbery impression material being uh, used to take an impression of the small area of interest of the door without having to seize that whole door. So it's not always that we take impressions because we're afraid that we're going to lose the uh, impression or lose the original markings. Sometimes it's just for convenience based on the relatively small area of interest and the relatively large object such as this door slab. Okay, another uh, type of evidence like glass that probably doesn't sound terribly exciting. Paint uh, is probably not one that got too many people excited when you saw that, but uh, it's actually a really interesting substance and something that's uh, very useful and uh, probably uh, many of us have uh, painted at least uh, home interiors and uh, it's not necessarily the most fun thing to do, but it does uh, for a relatively small cost spruce up a house. Uh, enamels are uh, the most common type of paint that we're looking at because they're what's used in vehicles and it's often in forensic settings we're looking at vehicle uh, crashes so car on car car on person car on object uh, and there's going to be a transfer of that enamel paint uh, when any of those um, incidents happen so we're looking mainly at paint chips right the pieces of paint that have uh, transferred or uh, been removed from the vehicle uh, as it hits that other object. Uh, lacquers were used in some GM cars uh, back uh, decades ago, um, so they're not as common anymore, but they were also another type of automobile paint. Nowadays, everybody's using enamel, so really enamels are all we're uh, seeing. Um, but there's also polyurethanes. Uh, those are typically um, put over stains so that you can still see the wood grain and things like that. But lots of different types of uh, paints and uh, the, we'll talk about the binders and the pigments and all that when we get into a, a deeper discussion of paint. All right, another classification of physical evidence, liquids. So these liquids may be uh, volatile liquids, things that explode easily like nitroglycerin if we think about our explosives. Um, they could be biological liquids like the body fluids we talked about. They could just be hazardous liquids, liquids that uh, would cause harm to individuals and may have been intentionally given to individuals to cause them harm. So those are a few different types of uh, liquid evidence and again it just um, evidence that uh, might be important for an investigation that happens to be in the liquid phase. Uh, metals, so now we're typically dealing with solids. Uh, mercury would be our one room temperature and pressure metal that's a liquid, but uh, the others would be solids. Uh, we could be dealing with metal filings or fragments. Uh, we could be dealing with radioactive or poisonous metals. There was a case uh, where a former Russian KGB agent was poisoned uh, with a uh, metal by uh, delivery through a tip of an umbrella uh, as he um, either got on or off the subway and died within a relatively short time. So uh, that's uh, one of our more famous cases of metals being involved in uh, a murder investigation. And probably one of my favorite areas that's uh, probably the least exciting sounded question documents. So uh, not terribly exciting name for uh, an area that has a lot of different uh, potential document types. So letters, checks, wills, currency, chart, obliterated, indented documents. Uh, this is the sort of uh, investigation uh, into question documents. Again, mainly currency. So uh, potentially fraudulent currency um, is the uh, bulk of the question documents, uh, physical evidence type. But uh, again, any of this could be important, especially in white collar crime, you might see uh, where letters or uh, other sorts of documents, wills being altered, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, again, those of us who um, don't have as much money as we probably would like to are interested in things like counterfeit currency and uh, how the counterfeiters can make it look so convincing and how the uh, federal government keeps ahead of it with uh, the different security features to uh, make sure that our currency is legitimate and it's not mistaken for uh, fraudulent currency.
Okay, looking at computers now, I'm old enough to remember all of those different devices you see on the screen. Um, computing uh, has changed quite a bit in the past uh, few decades. Uh, and um, in the early days of uh, computers, the evidence wasn't always so um, uh, carefully collected and observed. Uh, oftentimes it was neglected, but uh, nowadays the first thing you do when someone's missing, you check their social media posts and uh, check for emails that might indicate who they may have been meeting or where they may have been going. Uh, so uh, computers have really taken over uh, in terms of being a, a go-to uh, type of physical evidence, whereas in the past they were uh, really not very well regarded and uh, often overlooked. But uh, we have the Computer Security and Forensics Program. Uh, if anybody's involved in that, then you know more about computing than I do. Uh, but uh, we will talk about some basics, hardware, software, uh, those of us who still like to have a physical drive, uh, it's mainly the USB drives nowadays that have replaced the floppy disks. Um, email is uh, still popular, at least uh, for people uh, old enough to uh, remember having their first email account uh, when they were an adult instead of growing up around email. Um, but uh, those are all uh, potentially uh, good sources of physical evidence from computers. All right, so we already talked a little bit about transient evidence back when we showed the impressions, but um, just to uh, refresh your memory from uh, reading the text, that this is physical evidence that may degrade or disappear over time. That's what it means by transient. So it's there now, but it may not be there later. Uh, so odors, uh, perfume or gasoline, explosives, smoke, um, the last few probably more important for arson. Uh, the first example, perfume, may be more important for identifying a victim or a suspect. Uh, but any of those will dissipate with time, so it's important that they're noted uh, and uh, collected at the time they're observed because they may not be around later. Uh, temperature, so um, things cool to room temperature, we looked at that with um, the uh, bodies when we talked about the medical examiner may uh, be uh, determining the uh, time of death. So uh, that post-mortem interval is, is the body uh, heat dissipates with time uh, is one measure of uh, how long the person has been dead if it's relatively recent that they passed away. Um, the surroundings um, temperature fluctuates, right? If we're talking about outdoor surroundings, it's a different temperature at night versus the middle of the day. Um, coffee, we assume, is warm when someone's drinking it. So if it's cooled, then it's been there a while. Uh, if we have water in a bathtub, right, it's probably warmer when the person's taking their bath than later on when it's cooled to room temperature. Um, car hoods, we mentioned the cadaver already, but a car hood, if it's warm, the car has been used recently. If it's cold, the car probably hasn't been driven in a while. So that sort of thing. Uh, and finally, where we've already discussed it, the impressions or pattern uh, evidence, so footprints, tire tracks, teeth mark, in perishable food, for instance, the, uh, everything will degrade with time if it's not uh, captured with some sort of impression material. So that's one way to deal with transient evidence is try to lock it in uh, by collecting and preserving rather than just allowing it to disappear or degrade. And we go back to our good friend Edmund Locard with the transfer evidence. So any physical evidence that is transferred. So victim to perpetrator, perpetrator to victim, victim to crime scene, crime scene to victim, perpetrator to crime scene, crime uh, scene to perpetrator. So we've got all these different options here. And the example we, we see here is a dog hair from a victim's house transfers to perpetrator's pants. So if uh, the uh, perpetrator uh, or suspect there does not have a dog and we find this dog hair that's consistent with the victim's dog uh, then that can be some pretty uh, damning evidence and uh, certainly would warrant some follow-up with that particular suspect. So uh, as Locard reminds us every contact leaves a trace so we really want to be looking for all the different permutations we see there about how the um, victim perpetrator and scene interact with each other at the time of the crime. Okay, so we have a new term here, associative evidence, and that's any type of evidence that can link an individual to a crime scene. So 
Uh, for instance, on the previous slide, we had the dog hair from the victim's house uh, on the perpetrator's pants. Well, that would link, as long as we can identify that as specifically belonging to the dog of the victim, then we can now link the suspect to the victim's home through that dog hair. So uh, there is an example of associative evidence. Now we can consider the different categories of evidence. I've already been tossing around the terms individual and class characteristic evidence. So uh, let's define those before we go any further. Individual characteristic evidence is associated with a single unique source with high probability. So this is your uh, really most valuable type of physical evidence because of that, that you can identify a single person from it. So fingerprints, DNA, uh, bullet comparison, uh, big pieces that fit together. So if we had, say, a window broken uh, and you can fit those window glass pieces back together like a jigsaw puzzle, uh, that would be an example of an individual characteristic uh, class of evidence because uh, it's not just window glass, it's the glass from that window. And those are the fingerprints of that person or the DNA of that person. Uh, contrary uh, to the individual characteristic evidence, we have class characteristic evidence, which is associated with a group of people. So blood type. Um, and we see on our uh, right of the slide the um, prevalence of blood type in the United States. So uh, if you're type O, uh, then you're in good company, right? 45% of the population is type O. Type A is 40%. So those two cover about 85% of the population. Uh, type AB would be the least common at 5%. Type B, uh, slightly more common at 10%. Uh, but again, uh, if we're dealing with even a small population, a population of 100 people, you'd still have five people who are type AB. Uh, statistically speaking, that's what you'd expect. So again, it narrows things down, class characteristic evidence, especially as you compile more and more uh, examples of class characteristic evidence, but it doesn't link it to a single person like individual characteristic evidence will. Okay, so those are the different uh, classes of evidence. Now let's talk about the collection of evidence. So the Fourth Amendment assures us that uh, we will not be subject to unreasonable search of houses or seizure of property. Uh, now note the key there is unreasonable. We're not assured of no searches. We're just uh, assured of no unreasonable searches. And again, there can be seizure of property, just not unreasonable seizure. So uh, how do we uh, mitigate that? Well, it's a judge, right? A judge ultimately decides if a search warrant uh, can be issued. And uh, so the judge uh, is going to take our rights seriously and is going to expect uh, to be presented with probable cause, uh, a good reason for uh, taking uh, this uh, person's um, Fourth Amendment rights and saying that this is reasonable to uh, search their home or seize their property because uh, of the uh, case that the um, officers make to the judge as to why a warrant is necessary in this case. So. Uh, that's important, uh, although uh, warrants not always necessary, it's always a good idea to get one if at all possible. Uh, we'll talk in a moment about the uh, exceptions to the warrant, but again, it's always a good idea if at all possible to get the warrant signed by a judge uh, based on your probable cause before moving forward with a search and seizure. Okay, so as mentioned, there are exceptions to getting a search warrant. Uh, where uh, there's just not the uh, ability or the need to get that warrant. Uh, and there are four exceptions we'll discuss. The first three are here on this slide. So emergency circumstance. If someone's life is in danger, then you don't have time to go and get a judge to sign a search warrant before you, you know, come charging in to help that person. So in that case, you, you definitely need to move and act and you can't uh, worry about whether or not evidence is going to be deemed inadmissible because you didn't have a search warrant. Uh, it should be pretty clear to everyone if the emergency circumstance was real that uh, you had a right to enter and uh, to uh, help that individual. Uh, likewise, prevent the destruction of evidence. So if uh, there's a fire set to destroy evidence, while well, the fire department or uh, the police department or a combination of those two teams can work together to search and seize uh, immediately after the fire has been contained uh, because many of the uh, chemicals, the accelerants that might be used evaporate quickly, 
uh, there can be an uh, initial search right after the uh, fire has been uh, put out without the need for a warrant. A subsequent search, we'll talk about a legal case there where the subsequent search will require a warrant, but at least that initial search does not require a warrant uh, for something like a fire that was set to destroy evidence. Um, the next one is the trickiest one of all, consent, right? The suspect gives permission to the search. That's not one that I would take too um, lightly. Uh, you've got to document it. Uh, you've got to make sure that it's uh, pretty ironclad because a suspect might say it's fine to do the search until they realize that you find something that uh, is incriminating. Then they might say that they never gave that consent. So you really want to make sure you document that. Uh, to death so that there's no question as to whether or not the person actually gave consent and that they had the right to give consent to the uh, officers for searching that particular uh, home or business or whatever the case may be. So consent's a tricky one. Use it sparingly is my advice. Okay, and finally, the last exception we'll discuss is the uh, pursuant to a lawful arrest exception to the search warrant. So once arrested, the suspect can be searched along with his or her immediate surroundings. Now, the key there is this has to be a lawful arrest. That can't be some bogus thing that was used to just get in that search without a warrant. Uh, so uh, be careful with this one as well. Make sure that, you know, all the uh, I's are dotted and T's are crossed and that there's no doubt that this was pursuant to a lawful arrest and therefore there was no need to obtain a search warrant in this case. All right, so despite what the CSI shows and a lot of the crime dramas might have you believe, uh, not every place has a huge team of crime scene investigators at their disposal. So uh, the crime scene team uh, is typically local law enforcement for most uh, situations. But uh, again, if it's a particularly large city uh, like uh, Miami or Las Vegas or where you see the CSIs uh, were set, um, then uh, they, they certainly do have crime scene investigators. Or if it's a really high profile case in a smaller area, then they may have uh, people come in to help. So the crime scene team, the crime scene team rather, aids and assists law enforcement in the investigation of a crime. They can help to secure and document the crime scene. Uh, they handle, collect, and package physical evidence, and they can uh, reconstruct evidence with law enforcement. So the, the events can be reconstructed through things like software programs and uh, other um, sorts of analyses. So uh, again, if it's, you know, a relatively minor thing, then local law enforcement is doing this themselves, processing crime scenes, they're getting periodic updates and training, uh, but doing most of the work themselves along with their little FBI standard flip book. Uh, but if it's, you know, a large city or uh, just a high profile case, then there may be specialists involved. So regardless of the specifics, uh, the procedure at a crime scene is the first officer on the scene is responsible for the ADAPT. That's an acronym meaning A, assess the crime scene and assist those that need help. D, detain any suspects or witnesses to make sure that you get their statements. Uh, A, arrest the perpetrator if the perpetrator is still at the scene. Uh, P, protect the crime scene from contamination, and T, take notes. We'll talk about how important those copious and detailed notes will be for legal proceedings that may be uh, years away. So um, again, whether we're talking about a small town or a big city, um, when the crime scene's first discovered, it's that first officer on the scene that's responsible for making sure these steps are taken. Okay, so the first rule for processing a crime scene is to secure the scene. That's a whole lot of potentially important physical evidence that you do not want contaminated or disturbed. So uh, securing the scenes critical. Again, uh, it's making sure that it's safe. We already talked about the idea of arresting any uh, perpetrators, uh, checking to see if there's anyone who needs help. Uh, those are the most important things you can do for the the health and safety of everybody involved, but securing the scene and documenting everything is critical afterwards so that uh, whatever has taken place uh, can be preserved for later analysis, all right? When we talk about documenting detailed notes, uh, so field notes, uh, photographs, videos, sketches, anything you can do 
uh, because it may be uh, years before you're called to testify. And um, just like any witness, uh, your credibility is going to be questioned if you're going based on your memory. But if you have all these different documents uh, to uh, help you remember the particulars of the scene, then you're going to be seen as a more trustworthy witness. Um, so after securing that scene, conduct a crime scene survey, a walkthrough, uh, try to find the key pieces of physical evidence, try not to miss anything. We saw in the OJ case where um, things were not found in that initial search and then later found, and that makes it uh, to a jury anyway, that makes it sound like maybe things were planted by uh, law enforcement, and we certainly don't want any question as to the integrity of the investigation. So the forensic team searches, packages, documents, evidence to be analyzed at the crime lab, and of course does so correctly. We already talked about the idea of uh, body fluid evidence, biological evidence needing to be dried and packaged in paper to prevent molds from degrading the sample. So uh, make sure that, that you're up to date. And uh, as I mentioned, people uh, in law enforcement will typically carry around the FBI standards uh, flip book, a handbook to remind them of the proper protocol for collecting different types of physical evidence. In order to make sure you find all the different physical evidence that's present at the scene, you want to make sure that you use an appropriate search pattern for the scene. So uh, we have here um, what's called a parallel search, also known as a line or a strip or a lane search. Uh, and all of these uh, search patterns are going to be shown in this tiny little room and uh, not most of them will make sense there. So uh, this sort of parallel search makes sense in a large outdoor space where you've got a uh, relatively limited uh, group of uh, officers to investigate and you need to cover a big space. So you wouldn't do this sort of search pattern in a tiny room like they show here, but it would be great for an outdoor um, search. Uh, also a search and rescue type operation where you're looking for a missing person. Uh, this is often what's done with local law enforcement and volunteers get together and uh, they would, uh, you know, uh, take a large outdoor place like a field and uh, they would each take a lane and uh, look for evidence uh, for um, the missing person. Now you can think of the grid search pattern as two of the lane searches, uh, two parallel searches that are at 90 degrees to one another. And so this would be useful for the same sort of scenario, but where you have a larger number. So if you've got a lot of police officers and volunteers that turn up for that um, missing person search, for instance, that I mentioned in the last slide, well, maybe you've got enough that you could spare uh, people to do a grid search, which will cover the same area somewhat, but allow for a more thorough search. Uh, again, it requires a much larger uh, crowd, so it's not always possible, but it certainly uh, is a more thorough pattern than the simple parallel search we just discussed. Again, not appropriate for a tiny little room like this, but for a large outdoor space, it's a great pattern. So a zone or a quadrant or a sector search, uh, again, three different terms for the same search pattern, um, probably still not quite the best for one room, but maybe for an indoor space. So especially the, the um, popularity of this open floor plan that a lot of homes have. Um, maybe you would divide up that large open space into four quadrants and then have each officer uh, check a zone that would probably uh, pretty much correlate to a traditional rooms that would have been walled off. But nowadays with the open uh, pattern, open layout, uh, they're not so defined. So you would just define spaces and have each officer take one zone. And now we finally hit the pattern that actually makes sense for the room. So the spiral search pattern, uh, it can go inward or outward. This one happens to show an outward spiral search where you start toward the center of the room and make your way out. You could do the same sort of thing inward, start at one of the edges of the room and work your way in in a spiral type fashion. And this is a great search pattern for a small space uh, where you've got uh, someone uh, looking for everything, not missing a thing if they do their spiral correctly uh, so that they can find any of the trace evidence, the physical evidence that may be difficult to spot. Uh, but with a thorough search pattern like this in a small space, you're likely to do your best to find anything and everything that might be present.
All right, we've already mentioned how important it is to try to uh, take documentation of that crime scene. So when you're recording the crime scene, keep in mind it can never be over-documented. Uh, you can always under-document, but you can never over-document. Of course, we have to balance that with the fact that things have to happen in real time and you can't be at one scene forever. Uh, but how can we document it so that we try to do uh, the scene justice? Well, in writing or in field notes, uh, very carefully describe the evidence and its location um, for um, visually documenting the scene. You should use photographs and sketches. Um, videotaping is, is far more common uh, today than it was in the past, uh, just because it's easier to um, store those video uh, tapes, those um, actual video files, right? In the old days, they actually were tapes, but nowadays they're just video files that can be stored and uh, they don't take up huge amounts of storage space like the videotapes in the old days. So um, important to, to uh, document that scene as many ways as possible. Uh, and from the scene documentation, uh, you can often reconstruct the crime scene by uh, computer software or other uh, types of programs. Okay, so here we see someone uh, taking photographs of some evidence. Uh, that's been labeled. So uh, we know that the initial search has already been completed and now it's the more detailed search where the different pieces of evidence have been numbered and uh, the um, photographer is there to collect it. We also see an example of a sketch, probably a computer software aided sketch, because if your um, artistic talents are as limited as mine, uh, then you're probably not going to be sketching freehand if you want to have something that's meaningful to anyone else uh, but yourself. So here's a couple different ways to record the crime scene as we see in this slide. And here we see a need for photo enhancement. Uh, for a long time, uh, law enforcement resisted the use of more modern technology with uh, photography. They uh, were still relying largely on the old film photograph uh, methods instead of the digital photography because they didn't want anyone in uh, court to imply that the uh, photos were uh, doctored, photoshopped, so to speak, um, when they were altered. Um, but there's been a lot of work where people can uh, show exactly what's been done to the photo and there's less concerns about that. So uh, most of the photography done nowadays is digital uh, as opposed to in the past where it was mostly um, you know, the old style of film cameras. So we see in this case the need for photo enhancement because it was just too dark in the original can't get a good sense of what's there by increasing the uh, brightness. You can see that we have an officer standing with his weapon uh, and we have a suspect on the ground. So uh, all that was altered in this case was the uh, brightness and um, it certainly brings out a lot more of the photo than the unenhanced photo. Whenever possible, it's good to have both the native and what we'll come to know as the annotated photograph uh, present. So here we have the evidence just as it was found. That's what we call a native photograph. So that's um, no question. The police have not tampered with that evidence. That's how it was observed and that's how it was photographed. And it's important to uh, have those native photographs. Uh, but in a photograph like this, a native photograph of a shoe print doesn't give us any indication of size. So uh, in addition to that native photograph, it's helpful to take what we call an annotated photograph that will give us a, an a idea of at least the size of the object. So here in this slide, we see the uh, object there, uh, the measuring device that's been added to the, uh, this is a different shoe print, of course, but it's been added there to give you a sense of the size of the shoe print. So an annotated photograph is uh, where we take that evidence and we add a measuring device. We're not trying to manipulate the evidence. We're just trying to make it more obvious that uh, in uh, this particular example, this shoe print correlates to a specific size shoe, whereas in the native photograph, that shoe print could have been any shoe. It could have been a child's shoe. It could have been an adult shoe. Uh, it wasn't obvious from the photograph the size of the shoe, whereas once we add the measuring device, now you can get that sort of information and the um, jury can see that in the annotated photograph.
Okay, when it comes to collecting evidence, I've already mentioned a few times that there's the FBI Handbook of Forensic Science that gives the standards. It's a relatively small flip book that uh, it, it does get updated from time to time, so it's important to have a current version of it, but it can be carried uh, by the local law enforcement who, as I said, they're you know trained from time to time uh, in uh, collection methods, but it may have been a little while and they may need to have that flip book to refer back to just to make sure that they're collecting and packaging the evidence properly. Contamination is our biggest concern, so um, that's why it's important that the evidence is collected according to standards. The contamination can come from the investigator, uh, it can come from the environment, it can come from other evidence. So we never want to package uh, multiple types of physical evidence together. We want a separate package for each because we don't want cross-contamination. Uh, to prevent the investigator from contaminating the scene, it's important that he or she wear a hairnet, gloves, shoe coverings, anything that will keep um, pieces of the investigator from becoming part of the scene. Sometimes even a Tyvek suit and mask could be worn if it's you know a very critical scene that uh, we don't want any um, potential contamination, any DNA evidence coming, for an example, from the investigator and contaminating the scene. Uh, the evidence should be collected with forceps for trace evidence. We don't want the, to be touching, even with gloved hands, it's, it's uh, not a good idea to be touching the evidence directly, use forceps or some other uh, tool to collect it. And finally, um, collecting controls is uh, sometimes overlooked. So collecting the evidence, typically officers uh, know that they need to collect the physical evidence, but collecting a control can be overlooked. Whereas, uh, for example, if we're looking at a, um, an automobile accident, uh, collecting uh, a control, a, a piece of paint, a chip of paint from away from the area of damage, uh, is important for comparison's sake and could be overlooked by someone who may not be so well versed in collecting evidence. Okay, when we're talking about evidence collection, we want to have the evidence collected properly at the crime scene. So uh, again, it may involve special collection materials. If we're looking at, at uh, trace evidence, we may be using a special vacuum to uh, take up fibers or hairs from uh, a surface. Uh, it may be as simple as just considering the type of bag that you would use. You know, maybe at the grocery store you like to use plastic bags. Well, plastic bags work for certain types of physical evidence, uh, but not so well for things like biological evidence, where paper is your go-to bag material. So just keep those things in mind as you're deciding uh, what's the best evidence collection methods for the particular type of uh, physical evidence under consideration. So when packaging that physical evidence, we need to consider the uh, category of the evidence itself. So we'll talk about four categories here, which match up pretty well with our text, but uh, not necessarily exactly. And so um, we'll talk about trace, chemical, biological, and miscellaneous. And so we'll look at, say, arson is one example of the miscellaneous category. So trace evidence, our text doesn't go into distinguish, but again, trace evidence is difficult to see. So the trace evidence could fall into one of the other categories that we talked about, but uh, for example, hair uh, would be uh, biological trace evidence, uh, fibers would be chemical trace evidence, uh, and then we go to some more biological examples. So when you're dealing with trace evidence, you want to take the entire carrier, whatever that trace evidence is on. If it's a drop of blood on a carpet, for instance, you want to take that uh, piece of carpet along with the blood and uh, package it separately from other evidence. You don't want to try and scrape the blood off at the scene, uh, take the blood and the small uh, swatch of carpet together, but don't put them with anything else from the scene. Uh, generally, uh, if we're dealing in trace, uh, even with biological, you can use plastic bags because it's such a small amount of biological material, it's probably already dry and uh, unlikely to have a mold problem. Uh, also, the plastic bags will have a nice white area for documentation and recording what the sample is. And then finally, to um, minimize any uh, chance that there's any tampering with the evidence before the crime scene uh, technician analyzes it back at the crime lab, uh, there would be a, an adhesive closure so that you have to tear it to open it once you get the um, forensic scientist back at the crime lab to analyze it. So it's tamper-proof, 
Uh, it should uh, eliminate any chances of the evidence being altered between the time it was collected and the time that it's analyzed. Okay, chemical is the term that our text uses for something that's uh, physical evidence that's not biological in nature. Uh, so again, this should be packaged separately. Since it's non-biological, it should be fine to use uh, plastic bags or even in a pinch, you could use druggist fold on a piece of paper. Uh, but because of the importance of the chain of custody, uh, it's better to use official uh, bags like the uh, plastic bag we see on the left with the chain of custody right on it, uh, as well as some other information that you can add as opposed to, uh, you know, sort of a uh, vague piece of paper that uh, was lying around. So we, we don't want the uh, defense to be calling into question the evidence. So uh, using official evidence bags is the way to go. Okay, when you have biological evidence, on the other hand, uh, you want to make sure that you use paper bags. Uh, you've dried the sample uh, and put in a paper bag where it can continue to dry, then store it in a refrigerator to uh, limit mold growth. Um, if you're dealing with a pool of blood, for instance, you'd have a special vial to collect. Uh, we see our uh, officer there swabbing the um, uh, the uh, mouth of the bottle that's likely to have saliva evidence so uh, he would put that swab into a paper bag so that it could continue to dry and not be subject to molds so again when we had trace biological evidence we figured it was such a small amount that it's probably already dry but with uh, larger biological samples we want to make sure that we keep the um, molds down to a minimum by allowing for uh, continued drying with a paper bag. Okay, and our text also mentions a miscellaneous category, which uh, could be pretty well anything, right? So uh, we'll look at the arson in this um, category, although the arson uh, samples could also be called chemical, right? They're non-biological, they are chemical in nature, um, but um, we'll just uh, look at them specifically here uh, because we do need to uh, package them differently, right? The accelerants, the um, chemicals that are used to start the fire, they're very volatile. Uh, it's amazing enough that they didn't all burn up in the fire, but some uh, likely soaked down into the um, point of origin for that fire. And so uh, you want to make sure to quickly collect uh, those accelerants and to package them in an airtight metal container so that you don't lose them. If you put them in paper or plastic, um, you know, the uh, paper obviously we like because it does breathe, it allows for exchange of gases, and that's a bad thing here when we want to trap these gases. And plastics, because of the nature of the accelerants, uh, they may be able to seep through the plastic as well. So really airtight metal container is the way to go for arson evidence, which we just lumped as one of our miscellaneous categories here uh, based on uh, the categories established by the text. Okay, so after the collection of evidence, now we have the evidence submission and holding considerations. So um, we certainly want to make sure that the evidence has been logged in. So uh, if you're submitting evidence, uh, make sure that it's kept in a secure locked area that you submit it to the crime lab um, in person, ideally, uh, and that uh, it's all done with all of the paperwork intact. So we see there's submission forms that will list all the evidence collected and the analyses or tests that will be performed. There's the chain of custody that records the date, time, and the name of anyone who's had possession of that evidence since it was collected from the scene. So um, it seems like you know a lot of paperwork, and it is, but it's necessary to preserve the integrity of the evidence to make sure that there's no question as to where the evidence uh, was and who was in charge of it and uh, that it was all handled appropriately and stored correctly and analyzed correctly. Uh, if we remember that OJ case that we looked at earlier, um, that was not done uh, correctly and um, you know evidence was being kept in trunks of cars overnight and it's just not the sort of thing that you uh, want to have in a case of that magnitude. So uh, lessons learned from OJ hopefully have resulted in people taking this much more seriously and preventing uh, any uh, future cases from being scarred by uh, all those forensic mishaps. Okay, so now let's look at conditional evidence. So this was produced by a specific event or action, 
and as such it's essential in crime scene reconstruction because conditional evidence will help to determine the sequence of event that led to the crime. So for example, if a vehicle was used in the crime, were the headlights on or off? Uh, was the radio on or off? And what station was it on if it was on? Were the doors locked or unlocked? Was the window opened or closed? What was the mileage on the vehicle? So uh, for instance, if uh, we're dealing with a nighttime high-speed chase, uh, and the uh, victim uh, didn't have his or her headlights on, well, that's a different scenario than if the police engaged uh, and, uh, you know, everybody was doing everything correctly and uh, there was a later uh, lawsuit against the police department for a wrongful death. This sort of thing has happened. And uh, in the particular case that I'm discussing here, the headlights were not on. And so they were able to show that based on the... Um, uh, headlight, uh, which was broken when the car crashed into an object, uh, the fact that the headlights were not on was visible based on the filament of the headlight. And so uh, the wrongful death claim was dismissed because the uh, suspect was engaging in this dangerous activity, driving at night without headlights to try to evade the police. And uh, it wasn't found to be the uh, police officer's fault that uh, this person, through their recklessness, was uh, killed by their a vehicle crashing into an object. So those sorts of considerations do become important, especially uh, when you're thinking about presenting a case to a jury. Uh, they're going to want to know how the uh, determination of the sequence of events was made, and it's made based on these uh, examples of conditional evidence. Okay, so finally, to sum it all up, the reconstruction of the crime scene is the result of all of this careful work that we've discussed here in Unit 4. So uh, determining the sequence of events about what happened during and after a crime, using scientific fact gathering and logical evaluation, using physical evidence found at the crime scene that's been analyzed correctly after it was pr uh, properly um, you know, secured and collected and stored, uh, and uh, having that analysis answer questions about what took place. Uh, all of that leads to this reconstruction of the crime scene. And we see here a picture of a computer program being used to reconstruct this violent crime uh, for this particular example. Uh, that's the sort of thing that can be presented in a court of law and uh, can be used to uh, make a case against a suspect. And, um, you know, if everything was done correctly uh, and it's the correct suspect, hopefully gain a um, you know, a, a situation where that suspect is uh, taken to task and um, receives the appropriate punishment so that the family can get some um, feeling of justice and closure for whatever the uh, particular crime might have been. So a very important unit looking at the uh, collection and analysis of uh, crime scene evidence. And uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it and we look forward to talking again in the next unit. Take care, everybody.